Absolutely. We're starting to get back. And I'll tell you this, you, you were talking earlier about possibly being a Patriots fan. I'm thinking about jumping on, jumping on board too. They, they get Cam Newton. They get an MVP after an MVP leaves, a 40 year old MVP. I'm feeling pretty good about the Patriots right now. I know big Al, he doesn't, he doesn't agree with that too much, but other than that, <laughs> I, I'm liking the Pats right now, baby. I'm liking the Pats. Well, yeah. you mean you can't go wrong with red, white, and blue. That's your colors, and you're the Patriots. So you know I'm a veteran, and uh, I got to go. I got to go big on the Patriots there. But uh, you know I do like to pick on them for being the Cheatriots from time to time. They're not. They don't always cheat. They just can't be allowed to have anybody <laughs> but uh, specific. Uh, you know the mi- bare minimum of personnel on the sideline because we know if we give them one extra sideline personnel, they're going to use that to steal something from someone else. So we just got to be careful. They just got. They just got in trouble again. Oh yeah. In trouble again. These guys can't help themselves. <laughs> well, you know, when they had their own television crew on the sideline and it wasn't filming the game, you knew something was up. <laughs> a little sketchy, a little sketchy. That's <laughs> the reason Belichick doesn't give anything in press conferences because, you know, he's got so much to hide. It's ridiculous, but I, I can't wait to see what Cam Newton's able to do. Obviously that's, uh, you know, I, I'm not a football guy like you guys are, but Obviously, that's a much different system than what he's accustomed to. Tom Brady's been sitting back there in the pocket and just picking guys off 10, 15 yards or whatever. Now he's going to be able, now Bilicek's going to have somebody that can get out of the pocket quite a bit. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Cam, you know, he's been beat up a lot. We know that. Um, one, when I ever, I watch a game, I'm thinking, you know, it's third down and Cam Newton and, uh, you know, a lot like Deshaun Watson. I, I'm always worried about Deshaun every time he goes out there on third down because Deshaun doesn't really have that good of offensive line. He's been struggling over the past couple of years to stay off the ground. And, uh, I, you know, you can't do that forever. I mean, you know how long professional careers can last and it can be over before you know it. Not for long, not for long. And let, hey, let me ask you this: since we're talking uh, Clemson guys in the NFL, what's up with DeAndre Hopkins talking about Deshaun Watson? And, and it, it's not like he did it directly, but he's like, Julio Jones knows if I had uh, Matt Ryan, and then uh, Malcolm Thomas, if I had Drew Brees, you had Deshaun Watson, man. Like, am I missing something there? Was that kind of like a backhanded kind of ordeal? Like, what what's going on there? Yeah, I'm not really That's sure about that. That that doesn't seem very positive for DeAndre to say that. I mean, I know that uh, at least from some of the other tweets that he said, he's he's talked about how much he respects Deshaun Watson. I would hope to think it's not a disrespect type of thing. Maybe he's just talking about in the sense of uh, you know proven star power at the quarterback position. Maybe it's that that is the case. I'm hoping that's the case because Deshaun is still young. And still got a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, Drew Brees and Matt Ryan are definitely, I guess you would say, more of a pocket passer than than um, than than Deshaun Watson. Al, what do you think? I mean, did did you did you see that stuff? What did you think? I didn't really read into it a lot. I don't. <laughs> uh, DeAndre Hopkins has kind of put out a bunch of stuff, and I haven't really paid a lot of attention. But hey, maybe he's just talking about quarterbacks, not only star quarterbacks and proven quarterbacks, but quarterbacks that have an offensive line that can keep them upright. Okay. That's a that's a big deal, and Deshaun Watson has not had that, so maybe that's kind of affecting the outlook there. Now, Terrence, we were talking about, or I was kind of mentioning about the difference between, you know, this COVID situation and college players and COVID and professional players. Now, you've played college basketball. You've played professional basketball. Uh, do you feel like, I know football's got a lot more moving parts, a lot more players involved, but it, it, let's just say from your experience of basketball, let's just stay there. Do you feel like it's it would be easier for professional teams to stay quarantined and kind of stay safe compared to college players who obviously have to go to class and things like that have other obligations that they're kind of mandatory? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm I'm looking at how the NBA is planning on resuming in Orlando, and those guys are allowed to play golf, and that's about it. Now they have all kinds of great things going on as far as like on-site entertainment, but they're, they're keeping those guys locked up. And they're also giving guys an option to stay home if they want. So I think the latest person to do that is Wilson Chandler from the Brooklyn Nets. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt when it comes to transmission with college students having to go to in-person class. And it looks like that's what everybody's pushing for. Uh, there's going to be transmission. It's going to happen. Now, are these young people susceptible is the biggest thing. And once these 
young people get to campus, do you keep them on campus and not let them go home? It, it's it's a whole bag of worms that I'm not sure anybody knows the right answer. And the good news out of all this, the slight good news is with all these student athletes that have been coming back during these summer sessions, you're not you're seeing a couple guys get sick. And for the Clemson football team, the, they've actually been extremely transparent with their number of cases. Nobody is in serious condition. And I view that as a good thing. So um, if these guys are truly in some type of danger, I think you need to, you know, pump the brakes a little bit. But from every bit of evidence that has been presented, everybody who's tested positive has had minimal sy- symptoms at the most. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think, you know, we mentioned that as well, talking about the symptoms of COVID and, and how it's going to affect college uh, athletes across the, the nation and across the world, really. Um, we're on the line with Terrence Oglesby, former Clemson basketball player and uh, graduate assistant coach as well. Um, but I, I, I do agree. I think that, you know, at least college players are the, they got to be the healthiest of that age range. You know, um, they got to be at the peak part, uh, peak performance for their, their body and their, their, uh, you know, their, their, their genetic makeup. They, they are, they are elite athletes. So, um, you know, they should be able to handle this. They're not, you know, uh, unfortunately like our grandparents, but then you look at it and, you know, that's the biggest concern that you hear is, well, these kids are going to go, or these young men, women are going to go around. They're going to have it. They're going to be carriers and they're going to get it to a fan or get it to someone who's watching it, maybe older. You know, I know, Hey, uh, think about this. Nobody's really talked about this out. This just popped in my head. The run to the field after a football win. Yeah, that's is that happening. is that over with? Yeah, that's <laughs> obviously not going to happen. That's not going to happen. There's no yeah. way. Yeah, there ain't no way they're letting anybody get on the field. Yeah. <laughs> so I that's mean, one that's tradition what, that's gone. What I would assume. Yeah, so that's one tradition gone. We who knows? I mean, you know, you're not going to be uh, the basketball players are going to, you know, they they get a big win. Um, they're just going to have to get off the court, just like the referees, you know, the, or the, uh, the umpires, you know, they just run off the field real quick. Uh, basketball players are going to have to do that too. You're not going to have that interaction. Uh, those, 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 uh, fan days where you're going to get autographs and stuff, very limited. It's going to be a while before that fun stuff comes back. And we've already seen a lot of stuff on hold, but let's get it to in, in, into something that's a little bit more on the positive note, and that is Clemson's newest basketball commitment, and that is Joshua Beadle. He is a combo guard, 6'3", 168 pounds, from Cardinal Newman School in Columbia, South Carolina, class of 2021. 24-7 Composite has him as a .9281, which is a three-star overall, um, and got some highlights I want to pull up real quick and play them while we're kind of talking about this, and uh, here we go. Some highlights from huddle.com. You'll be able to see that. 17 points per game for this guy, and I'm looking at him. I like what I see as far as his movement to the basket. Man, when he makes the decision to drive to the basket, he goes quick and gets there and gets up and gets it off the backboard into the basket. Um, he's not afraid of pulling up for a three-point shot whenever he they, he's left open. And it looks like to me, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but Al, it looks like he's a he's a lefty. Yeah, he is. Uh, and I'll tell you what, kind of wh- how I was going to do this. I know we were going to have a roundtable with Houston here. It's a little bit different now. But I, I'll tell you, uh, Terrence, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you what I see when I look at this guy's film. I'm going to take, you know, give you all the notes that I have. And what I want you to do is kind of respond any, anything you disagree with, you know, anything you agree with that might stand out. And if you would give us a player comp, uh, maybe a current player or a kind of a former player that you might compare him to. So, you know, what I'm kind of looking at when I see his film is, you know, like you said, one of the first thing you notice is that he's a lefty. Uh, and again, this is highlight film. So, but you know, according to the film, he's, he scores at all three levels. He pulls up for three. He's got a nice stop and pop from mid range. Uh, he can drive to the basket. Like Morgan says, when he makes the decision, he goes and he's really explosive to the basket. You can see uh, several highlight dunks on his film there. Uh, he's a good ball handler. Uh, he handles the ball in traffic really well. Uh, I love his passing ability. I think he's a good distributor. Um, you know, one thing I noticed, by the way, when he's taking his three-point shots, and this is just kind of from his film, he looks like he has a bit of a staggered stance with his left foot kind of more towards the rim. I'm interested to see if they'll kind of fix that in college. You know, a lot of times you want to be square to the basket, obviously. That's what a lot of a great shooters will do. They'll be they'll be square up with their feet. Uh, but he's a really instinctive player on defense. He kind of jumps the passing lanes a good bit. 
Uh, whether he'll be able to do that and get away with that in college is a different story. We'll kind of see what Brad Bonnell teaches him to do. Uh, but I really like what I see from this guy. I think he's going to be a, a good scorer and somebody that can be reliable uh, to get in there and, and get us some points uh, for sure and be a consistent type scorer. And I'll pass it to you, Terrence. Um, first of all, before we before you kind of respond to Alan's thoughts, well, you don't even you don't even you don't even need me anymore. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> well, but before you don't even need me before you you respond or give your your insight as well. And like I said, we've got some some highlight footage running about five minutes worth of huddle on the screen, um, and you can watch that over on our YouTube or Facebook channel if you're listening to the podcast. But um, Tell us a little bit about his high school. I know you mentioned that on Twitter that he's from Cardinal Newman. He's, uh, I believe, he's like the starting point guard or, or you know, kind of a combination guard. He plays a little bit both positions. Um, is is that a good high school? Is he is he a as far as a in state player? Is he is he pretty legit? Uh, he's he's one of the top you know three or four players in the state. There's no doubt. And a lot of what you said, Big Al. I mean. You're right on it. Now, as far as his, his form on film, it looks pretty good, but there's a couple of things that you can't see on film. And that's one thing that has stood out to me. And I've talked to several uh, college coaches as well as people on the AAU scene. He plays with great pace and he passes the ball really well. And a lot of times uh, when you're watching these highlight films or, and, and things of that nature, you aren't really able to see how a guy knows the game. You're more so just seeing what kind of athlete he is. And that plays a big part. Uh, the first, the first person that a lot of people like to throw out there simply because he is left-handed and he has, and he has good pop in his legs. He gets up there and, and he's able to get out in the passing lanes and he's got good length for a combo guard and he can play on or off the ball. The first person that a lot of people want to say is John Newman, obviously. Uh, that is not what I have been told. Uh, he's fallen into a great situation. The person that, that keeps getting thrown around, uh, that I've talked to is Shelton Mitchell. Junior year Shelton Mitchell, but he's got a little bit more athleticism and he's not quite as good of a passer, but he's a little bit better of a score. And he's somebody who's going to come in. He's going to have time and he's a top 150 kid, but he's going to have time. He's going to be able to come in when Alamir Dawes is a junior. Nick Honor is a junior. Chase Hunter is a junior. By the time his junior year, it's his, it's his show. And he's got good length. He's able to play on or off the ball, which is a big thing for his early development, his ability to get on the floor early. There's a lot of optimism, uh, optimism coming around about this young man. And he's, his shot, it, it, is, it has a little bit of a funky hitch. But for the most part, there's not a, there's not a ton to fix. And it, like I said, he plays with great pace and he plays within himself. Now, when you first get a guy on campus, let's just put you in the coach's position. So, what are your what are your kind of uh, goals for him as you see him right now? What would be maybe two or three of your goals for him if you were in Brad Brownell's position? What would you say? Hey, this is what I want you to do in your freshman year, not necessarily on the court, but I'm talking more off the court. What are some things you think? Well, more than anything, as far as the basketball side is concerned, uh, off the court you have to learn the terminology. Brad Brownell's system is not an easy system to run. It, it's it's very complex. And it's very different from the system that I came up with, Oliver Purnell. There's a lot of ins and outs. There's a lot of different calls. And there's a lot of different sequencing that he's going to have to learn. Now, from everything I've been told, he's a high academic kid. He's a high character kid, high basketball IQ kid. He should be able to slide in and learn these things fairly quickly. And especially with all of his physical tools and his makeup, I, I, I think he's going to be able to really take off and uh, learn some of those things. But the first thing that you do really – is you really try to get him to understand the physicality of college and really the all day grind that college is. I mean, you're up there at 6 a.m. and you're sweeping all the way through till that evening time. So that early summer school adjustment, as soon as he comes in after his senior year in high school, uh, just learning, you know, what it takes to be a successful collegiate athlete is the big thing uh, as soon as he comes in. And then after that, mostly just terminology and defining the style that, Clemson's going to play. 
And I got another question for you. This is kind of like behind the scenes type thing, but you know, how, how much is Brad Brownell involved in those specific types of things that you mentioned with getting him appli- acc- acclimated to college life and getting him acclimated to the, the playbook and, and how things run? Is, is that kind of on Brad Brownell or does he kind of pass that on to his assistant coaches? Kind of what is the interaction? You know, sometimes I think Brad Brownell is kind of more of, uh, and, and really all coaches, even like say Dabo Sweeney, would be someone you, you might only see uh, every once in a while because he's such the, the figurehead of the entire program. And it may be different in football because there's so many players. So the, the freshman right. tight end might not see Dabo Sweeney that much. But as far as a freshman basketball player, how, how much interaction do they get with the head coach throughout their first season? Well, one thing that I've learned, uh, at least from listening to Dabo and listening to other very successful coaches, is you hire the right people and you let them do their job. And Coach Brownell has done a nice job of putting together a staff with Coach Gowen, Antonio Reynolds-Dean, and Dick Bender that are able to uh, teach exactly what he wants. And obviously, the head coach carries a tremendous burden of responsibility just from being able to uh, having to deal with so many different functions. You know, you got to keep in mind during the off season, typically you're dealing with, uh, you know, things for Ipte, you're dealing with prowl and growl, you're dealing with all these different golf tournaments and all, and, and everything like that. So for the most part during the summers, now you got to keep in mind too, there's about 15 or 16 people on staff that are there for basketball players. So you got your academic people that take care of them. You got your uh, GAs, you have your strength coach, you have your, uh, trainer and everything like that, anything that these guys need, they have access to. But as far as that's concerned, Brownell is in there a lot, especially early in the summer, but he also lets those guys break down into their position groups. You know, Antonio Reynolds Deans, he typically has the big guys. Uh, Dick Bender, he typically has the younger guys because he's very nuanced in his approach to teaching these young players. And Coach Goins wasn't there when I was there. But Steve Smith was there when I was there, and he did a lot of things uh, with the older guards and older players and kind of getting them ready, uh, you know, for their next steps uh, along the way. And it's it, those rotations between the two guard coaches, they can switch sometimes. But for the most part, you hire the right people and you let them do their job. And Brownell has done a nice job of that, especially with uh, Antonio Reynolds-Dean, uh, who has done a fantastic job recruiting for the program. Well, no wonder Brad Brownell yells so much at the assistant coaches when something goes wrong. Because it's like, you should have told, who taught this kid? You know, who's teaching this guy? And obviously he's talking to the assistant coaches because it's a lot of their responsibility, right? To, to make sure, hey, when, when Brownell calls this play, you got to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And those guys have to echo it because there's so many things going on during the se- during a game or during the course of a game or during the course of a season that that he has to have full trust in those guys and obviously he does because he's able to tell them something one time and the, and his assistants are able to carry through and, and that's one thing man like coach Brownell has done a nice job of letting guys do their job and he gets on he holds you accountable there's no question about it but at the same time he gives those assistant coaches a certain level of respect and freedom to coach and to do things. I'm not going to say their way, because obviously it's the head coach's way or nobody's way, but a a certain way of communicating. And and those three assistants obviously have been able to do a good job with that. Well, again, we have Terrence Oglesby on, a former Clemson basketball player, talking about the newest recruit, uh, Josh Beadle, and the combo guard. Alan did a little preview of him. Terrence did a little preview of him, and we talked a little bit behind the curtain. So if you missed any of that, if you're just joining in, make sure to check out our Facebook page or our YouTube page. You'll see the replay of this clip, or you can listen to us on the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. But again, thank you so much, Terrence, for for joining us. You got any big plans basketball-wise uh, for this summer, or are you just kind of you know playing in the backyard? Uh, we actually just moved back to Clemson. We... Uh, our house is not quite finished, but we decided to move in anyway. So I've basically, that's all I've been doing for the past, uh, I want to say two months is trying to get ready to move in and get our family moved down. So uh, that's the reason my, my, my podcast hit a bit of a snag there for a little bit, but I just put another episode up. So I've been doing that. And then um, also just golly, I, I feel like everybody else just trying to get through to December when I get this vaccine. So we can kind of get back to some sort of normalcy. 
So uh, as far as basketball is concerned, I'm going to try to, to, you know, volunteer and do a little bit of work at various camps. And, uh, you know, if there are any camps to be had and, and basically help any kid out that I can as far as that, because I still know quite a few coaches and this, that, and the other. So, uh, you know, just try to help some kids. And, and I can't wait for the NBA to come on either. And then I might be able to go on a vacation around August. That would be pretty good. There you go. There you go. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Terrence, and uh, joining us tonight and talking a little bit of Clemson basketball this summer while we wait and hope for the best. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Thank you for having me on.